meaning we are applying mindfulness, we're investigating four types or classes of phenomena. First, we investigate the body. Then we investigate the feelings, and feelings here is not emotions. Remember, feelings is our pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral experiences. Then we investigate the mind. And lastly, we investigate phenomena in general. So this is the sort of the classic uh, presentation within the Theravada tradition, that we apply mindfulness and we investigate these four things, our body, feelings, mind, and phenomena in general. And investigating them, we come to see or realize three things, the three marks of existence. That first we come to realize that the body, the feelings, the mind, and phenomena in general are changing moment by moment. Everything we investigate has this quality of changing moment by moment, so that's impermanence. Then we come to realize suffering or dukkha in Sanskrit and Pali. To come to realize when we investigate the body, feelings, mind and phenomena, what is the basic human condition, that there is what we've come to realize is there's no ha genuine happiness to be found out there. That it, and also that at the deepest level, we come to realize that there's always a potential for suffering to arise in our life. Because our mind is contaminated by the mental afflictions. We come to see that by investigating these phenomena. And then lastly, at the deepest level, we come to realize no self, that nowhere in any of these phenomena is there to be, a, is there a self to be found. So let's just go through these a little bit more detail. So of course impermanence is again the fact that everything's changing moment by moment. And of course, that's something we all, I think, intellectually accept already. Science has proven that, I think, and we learned it at school. But again, here, Vipassana practice is about coming to experience that directly, not just intellectually accept it. So what we did in that meditation, of course, is we were focusing on the first application of mindfulness. We're investigating the body. And through scanning the body, we come to see that the reality of the body is that everything there is changing moment by moment. And then, of course, we can apply the same practice to observing our feelings, our pleasant, unpleasant experiences, observing the mind and observing phenomena in general. And we can come to realize that wherever we place our attention and investigate, everything we experience is changing moment by moment. And that will, as I said, if we can come to realize this, not only will our mental afflictions, in particular our attachment and aversion, dramatically decrease, but really if we can really appreciate that, we're very close actually to realizing this emptiness that we're going to look at tomorrow. Because, as I think I already mentioned, is often when we hear about impermanence, 
We hear it described as things changing from moment to moment. And then we often have an idea of impermanence like this, that in, the, in this moment there's a thing, in the next moment it changes, in the next moment it changes. But if we can really appreciate impermanence, our experience of impermanence, we'll realise this is not impermanence. Because no matter how short a moment of time it is, if there is a thing there during that moment... It means it's not changing during that short, brief period of time, which means it's not impermanent. So this is not impermanence. Impermanence is this, that there is no thing you can point to that is in any given time static. It's constant change. And if we can really realise that as part of the realisation of impermanence, I think we're very close to realising this emptiness. Then... In terms of suffering here, we already looked at this also earlier, in the, I think in the context of um, loving kindness and compassion, is that here we're talking about dukkha, the human condition. And this is a classic example of how often terminology can be confusing. Because here we're talking about the human condition and often it's translated as the word suffering. But for us, normally when we hear the word suffering, for that, for us, that normally implies some sort of unpleasant, painful, physical or mental experience. So of course here, Buddhism never says that our whole, our human condition is that we're always in unpleasant, painful, suffering experiences. Part of the human condition is that, of course, sometimes we have unpleasant, painful experiences, but this word dukkha is a much broader term than normally we understand suffering. So included in dukkha, of course, is our pleasant experiences, because in the human condition, sometimes we have pleasant experiences. So remember, that was this dukkha of change that we looked at. And if we understand those pleasant experiences, again, if we understand them well or correctly, we can understand those pleasant experiences are temporary, transient. They'll, they never last. And therefore, they, they cannot give us any lasting, genuine happiness. And then we can appreciate that, and then we'll stop looking out there for some sort of lasting, genuine happiness because it's nowhere to be found. But at the deepest level, here when we investigate the human condition, we can see that underlying both our pleasant and unpleasant experiences is the fact that there's always a potential for suffering to arise in our life. And we'll come to see that very clearly that that is because our mind is contaminated by mental afflictions. So as long as there's mental afflictions in our mind, there's always a potential for suffering to arise in our life. And so that is this realisation of suffering, the human condition. And if we can come to realise this we'll not only realise there's no genuine happiness to be found out there, we'll realise the source of suffering, source of happiness is within our own mind, and that will lead us to developing the aspiration to be free of suffering, to find this genuine happiness. And remember, this aspiration here uh, normally is translated as renunciation. And then, of course, with this aspiration for liberation then, based on this, we do the application of mindfulness, we investigate these four classes of phenomena and come to see there's no self to be found anywhere there. And so what do we mean by no self? This word self here is a translation of the Sanskrit word atma. And there were a number of traditions 
at the time of the Buddha, who also talked about the idea of multiple lives and the idea of liberation from suffering and so forth. And a number of these traditions said that what went from life to life and what achieved liberation from suffering was this Atman. And that this Atman had three qualities. That it was unchanging, unitary, meaning a single thing, and completely independent of everything else. The Buddha, of course, refuted this idea of self, that such a self logically can't exist, because if the self is unchanging, it means we couldn't do anything. And the fact of it being unitary and independent would mean that this self we, could, we must be able to have a sense of me somewhere over there because it's completely independent of body and mind. We never have a sense of person completely independent of the body and the mind. So from a Buddhist perspective, this idea of self is not something we instinctively have. That we would only have this through some uh, wrong way of thinking. So this is what's called intellectually acquired ignorance through wrong way of thinking and understanding. But there is an instinctive sense of self that we do have that we are to come to realise here. And that is... Could you please... Sure. So this first idea of self is an idea that was put forward by some traditions at the time of the Buddha as to how the self really exists, that the self or the person that uh, moved from life to life and achieved liberation, they used the word Atma, had these three qualities of being unchanging, unitary, a single thing, and completely independent of everything else. And of course the Buddha refuted this and what we can see when we look at this is that we don't ever have this uh, false sense of self instinctively because this would imply that we could have a sense of self over there somewhere, that the self would be completely independent of our body and mind and we never have a sense of self completely independent of some aspect of our body and mind. So this idea of self would be only something that you would intellectually acquire, this idea through some wrong way of thinking. But the second one is something we do instinctively have, this false sense of person, this idea of self, and that is what the word normally is, self-sufficient, substantially existent. So self-sufficient here means that the me that seems to be here is, seems to be self-sufficient, meaning it doesn't seem to rely on anything else to exist. And it seems very substantial and solid. So this is the idea here. Um, another word sometimes used for this is the idea of a or an autonomous self. And sometimes in the text they also talk about this sense of self in the idea of the self being a master or controller. And we do instinctively have this false sense of person, that somehow we feel instinctively that somewhere here is a me, a me that's running the show, 
a me that is trying to control this body and mind, to be the master of this body and mind. And this me seems to be something more than just the body and the mind. It seems to stand apart from the body and the mind. In other words, be self-sufficient. And we have this in our language. We often say, I have a body. I have a mind. As if there's a third thing here somewhere, a me that has a body and has a mind. Something distinct from the body and the mind. We have this sense of me instinctively. Sometimes also we, have, we, we may look at our body, we don't like what we see, and we may even have the thought, I'd like to swap this for a, a more healthy, more younger, more beautiful body. Sometimes we have these thoughts. And then sometimes we look at our mind, which is a mess, and we may have the thought, I'd like to swap this mind for a more intelligent, more kind, less neurotic mind. And we have these thoughts. But where is the me that could do this swap? If we take out this body and take out the mind, what's left over? Is there anything left over? But that's what we instinctively uh, grasp onto. In our behaviour, we really instinctively feel that the me exists like this. And this is what we are trying to realise here, that we do not exist in this way. There is no me here that is something more than the body and the mind. That is what no self, the realisation is. Of course, this is not a realisation, there's no me, no person. No Buddhist tradition says there's no me, no person. The question is, how do we exist? And in the Theravada traditions, they're saying we do not exist in this way. We do not exist like this, as a person. Any questions about anything there? So when, when there is the reincarnation, what goes on? Okay. Um, if we go to the physical world first, if we just look superficially in the world, there seems to be objects in the world moving through time. Yeah? Seems to be. This pen seems to be the same pen as was here yesterday. It'll be the same pen here tomorrow. That's what it seems like. But if we look closely, very closely, at, is there anything at the physical world moving through time? Is there? Is there any static phenomenon in the entire physical world that moves through time? Because if it did, it would mean it would be unchanging. But everything is changing, and science, I think, has proven that. So, technically speaking, in the physical world, nothing moves through time. There is just a flow of change. And in that flow of change, to make sense of it, we create objects and we have to to make sense of this flow no so buddhism would say that just like the physical world the mental world is the same that if you look superficially it seems like we have there's a mind moving through time but if you look closely very closely at the mind you'll see that just like the physical world is just a flow of change the mind is a flow of change a flow of experience constant flow. So also the mental world in Buddhism is just a flow of change. So therefore, of course, the person is nothing more than the flow of the body and the flow of the mind. So there is no person here moving through time. Just like there's no physical object moving through time, there's no mind moving through time. Similarly, there's no person moving through time. So technically, the answer to the question, what goes from life to life, is nothing. Because the word go implies a thing moving through time. But there is an answer to this, and we'll look at that tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so, um, there is no self, okay, but uh, there is a certain mind and a certain body. And there is a person. And that's me. And th there's a person. Is it? Are you the body? I'm the combination of this body okay. and mind. Okay, and these here's, memories a question. And Here, here's a question. Are you the body or do you have a body? You can't be the body and have it. You're one or the other. Are you the body or do you have a body? You have a body, yeah? Mm -hmm. Are you the mind or do you have a mind? You have a mind. Are you the combination of the body and the mind or do you have a body and a mind? You have a body and a mind. So you are not, you are not the body and the mind. But you say it's the opposite, no? Why? <laughs> You just explained the opposite. No, I didn't. I said the me is not something more than the body and the mind. I didn't say the me is the body and the mind. <laughs> the answer to this will uh, hopefully become more clear tomorrow because it really, to answer this well, we have to really touch on this idea of emptiness. Isn't, isn't the me just one of the functions of the mind? You are a function of the mind. That sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? Okay, but it's the way I... Yeah, maybe. Are you, the, are you a function of the mind? Of my, of, okay. <laughs> that sounds a bit odd, I think, doesn't it? The child. Sorry? You want to frighten the child? Frighten the child? <laughs> <laughs> so I think to really answer this well, we need to talk about this idea of emptiness tomorrow and then we can come back to this. Because otherwise it's, it's very difficult to, to give a, a clear answer to this. Because we have to really talk about that tomorrow first. So we'll come back to that tomorrow, probably afternoon. Uh, the second assumption about the instinctive self-sufficiency of the... Oh, the second type of... Yeah, the one, yeah this one. Yeah. Why does Buddhism or the Buddha assume that this is instinctive? I'm, I'm asking because... Uh, because that's our experience. Right, but maybe it's also acquired because as I read from a researcher about ancient Mesopotamia, in the time of the uh, ethos called Gilgamesh, they say, the scholars, not me, no. that the sense of self uh, changed at that time, around three and a half thousand BC. And until then, the concept of this self, uh, sufficient self substantial didn't exist. It didn't? This is what they say regardless of Buddhism. They don't talk about Buddhism. They say that people li li lived in a whole different uh, state of mind without this instinctive self-sufficient, etc. And how did they draw that conclusion? From the legends, from the writings. Right, but remember writings is about intellectual stuff. I'm not arguing, I'm yeah. just asking upon what the Buddha Be Because through his direct experience, okay. not through some philosophy. Okay. So this is all about your own personal experience. Okay. So what people personally experienced three or four thousand years ago would be a bit difficult to determine. That's right. But to say that this is not also acquired from the mother is also a bit uh, difficult. But not acquired from the mother. From the culture. Oh, from the culture. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, the Buddhist assertion even dogs and cats have this. Oh. question for day nine, but uh, so because of the difference between the Theravada and the Mahayana, right. the Theravada say there is no self-sufficient substantially existent, but they don't negate the inherent existence. Correct. So there is an inherently existent self. Person, yes. Which is... Which... What is it in, in Theravada? Well... Hmm? What is this self in Theravada? The, it's because the basis, the body and the mind exist from their own side, in, exist inherently. Therefore, the person who's labelled on the body and the mind is inherent, because the basis is inherent. 
So the, remember in this tradition here, there's a, an objective world, real, inherently existent. Part of that inherently existent world, of course, is the body and the mind. So the matter and the mind are real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the person's labelled on that, and so since the person's labelled on the basis of something real, it's real. It's inherently existent. That's sort of the logic they use. But of course, the what we're going to look at tomorrow, my Jamikas would say this is a little bit illogical, in fact. But they don't see any fault in that line of reasoning. So does this all imply that emptiness, maybe for tomorrow, but that everything is interconnected but static? Nothing, Nothing static. But if um, my mind or my whatever doesn't go on to the next incarnation, but, 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 if, it, if it just seems like it's moving yeah. to me right. now, right. and it's not really moving, then it's all things at once because it's all interconnected, maybe. And then, then it's not really moving, it's just connected, isn't it? Actually, the last one. <laughs> I this, hope you will help me find Yeah, yeah, this pen, <laughs> yeah, according to <laughs> physics, mm -hmm. is not static, is it? According to physics. It's, mole it's made up of mo molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, which are constantly fluxing. Constant. Physics, classic physics. Yes? So there's nothing static here, according to physics. You said nothing really moves. And because the word go, the word something goes, something goes, when we use that word, it sort of implies there's a thing that is moving through time. Just the language. Isn't it? When you say something goes, you're talking about a static thing that moves through time. I mean, normally, that's the implication when you say something goes. So, according to physics, nothing goes. Because it, in classic physics, there's just change, flux of change, constant, isn't there? Here, everywhere. So there's no static pen moving through time, is there? But there's change. And this works. It functions, no? Yeah. <laughs> so what is the Taravadian um, uh, theory of impermanence? If things exist from the other side of the world, so how do they perceive the impermanence in their theory? A bit like that. So they have the idea that, that things exist from their own side that things exist inherently. Yeah. Of course, according to the view we're going to look at tomorrow, that would imply they're static and unchanging. But they don't see a fault with that. And the same, I think, in classic physics. Things exist from their own side, no? Atom, subatomic particles, they exist from their own side, independent of the observer. In classic physics. I don't think so. I think it's no? a matter of, uh, of terminology. terminology. That I don't think that the physics thinks that things uh, exist from their own side. They, of course, see the interdependence, the influence of the... Yeah, but from their own side... But, hang on. From, the from their own side means independent of the observer. It doesn't mean independent of other things. You mean... So you say... The observer. Now you yeah. The when observer. you say when the term from their own side means independent of an observer. Okay. So then we reach the, the <laughs> quantum field. So then, yeah. So yeah. Then we're moving there a little bit. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Um, so then this. Okay. Let's actually let's do a little meditation on looking for the self. Now, one piece of advice before we begin is here we're being like an empirical scientist, meaning we are observing reality. We're trying to find out how things are. So we, we're observing directly. So what we don't want to do is allow our intellectual mind to come into this and go, I know the answer. 